Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I am joined with the Hug Dealer. You are a Twitch streamer. I think um, you like the big bulk of your content is doing like the GTA 5 like role play uh content um you also post on youtube which i think from my understanding is just kind of like your vods um hug how are you doing i'm doing all right i'm doing all right so this isn't the one about pasta i thought i was talking about pasta no 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 it's <laughs> no no um because oh, i had a uh... lot to say about penny <laughs> No, but no, yeah, no. I do. Uh, I, yeah, I'm a Twitch streamer. I started, I guess you could say, from GTA RP on uh, the No Pixel server, and I've kind of been branching out more into variety. As much as I would love to post a, on a bunch more platforms, it's a lot more difficult due to uh, just circumstances. Right, right, and I actually kind of want to get into that with like my, you know, my next question. So. Um... I'm I'm always curious about like, you know, the complete story of how people, you know, get into content creation and things like that. And um for you in particular, because you're I think somewhat older compared to like a lot of other, I think, you know, um people that do like this type of streaming. So I, I guess I'm kind of curious as to like before you did like content creation, like what what was your story? Like what eventually led you to doing this? All right. Well, I appreciate you, you uh, going that full long route of calling me old. <laughs> yes, I'm old I too. I'm old too. And, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I am the minority when it comes to streaming. But um, I, before streaming, I was actually, uh, believe it or not, I it's a it's a really fancy title. It's a little ridiculous, but I like saying it because it, it always confuses people. But I was. Advanced Manufacturing and Integration Process Manager. And essentially what that is, is there's a process engineering team that goes into whatever construction job you're into. Uh, we happen to build yachts. And I would manage the, the engineers into basically how to create procedures to then use on the floor and, you know, work efficiently i guess you could say right yeah uh, so yeah it was i mean streaming was never something that i thought to do like it was uh an afterthought and then uh then life happened uh i've single parent my kids i've single parented them since they were eight years old uh, actually younger a little bit younger but it's just been me and, me and them for a long time. And first, my son started having uh, health issues. We first realized that he was on the spectrum and had um, Tourette's syndrome and ADHD at about, I'd say, uh, four or five years back. And the work industry does not take well to uh, fathers not being able to work 20 hour shifts because they have a child that needs medical attention. So that's where it all began. And the story just kind of keeps rolling downhill when it all comes down to physical health. So I began staying home and helping my son, taking him to all these practices and living off of a, off a savings essentially. Eventually, once I got his stuff in order was when I started to realize myself that I was completely exhausted at all times. This led me to finally go to the doctor. And uh, of course, doctors in the States are always very, uh, I guess you could say suspect to anything you're, you're saying. And my doctor kept thinking I was just being lazy you know uh, i'm tired because you're lazy you're tired because you're lazy you know oh you just gotta eat better you gotta exercise more after about a year of this it kept getting to a point where no matter how much i slept it was never enough eventually we did a sleep study and i was diagnosed with a rare condition called 
idiopathic hypersomnia. The best way I can describe that is um, it's like spending a night out, getting extremely drunk, going to bed when the sun's starting to rise, only to wake up like three to four hours later, and you have that groggy, forgetful haze around you at all times. And you're just completely exhausted. That's what my life is like, except for about maybe two to three hours of the day when I actually feel awake. And due to that and pre-existing social anxiety, I got to a point where I did not like leaving my house because I'm always yawning. I think people's perception of me is like, oh, here's a lazy guy. This guy's always yawning. This guy's this, this guy's that. And my only... I guess you could say my only venue of any kind of social interaction, unless we were talking pee pee and poo poo jokes with my kids, was finding people to talk to. Now, when you have social anxiety, it, it translates to the internet, and I don't know how to just say hi to someone. So I said, you know what? I'm going to stream. And it made it a hundred times easier because I was already on No Pixel role playing to help me get through a bunch of my stuff in life. And when I added streaming to it, it gave me the ability to be social without physically being in front of somebody. And that's really where it all started from. Mm. Yeah, very. Um, yeah, I think uh, you just so it's basically kind of and I apologize because I'm not like I have no like medical training myself. So it is like a form of like narcolepsy or is that just like more of uh, a lay, like a layman's terms? Uh, yes, it's a lot. Well, it's similar, but also very different. The reason I, I usually tell people on my stream, I have a little warning that says the streamer has narcolepsy. He may fall asleep. The reason I tell them I have narcolepsy is more so just to avoid the whole, well, what is idiopathic hypersomnia? You know, so it becomes this whole long talk I have to do. So I just say I have narcolepsy and people are usually like, oh, okay, so he falls asleep. And that's kind of just easier. But the best way to describe the differences in them is narcolepsy is like two toddlers on a playground and they're both fighting over who's going to use the slide first. Eventually one of them is going to win regardless of who it is. They're using the slide first. So in their mind, they have sleep that wants to go to bed and then wake that's telling them, no, we're supposed to be awake. If sleep wins, a narcoleptic person will fall asleep, but they instantly go into REM, which is rapid eye movement. They instantly start dreaming. When they wake up, they feel refreshed after a one hour nap. What separates narcolepsy from IH is exactly that. IH people do not go into a REM sleep. So I can fall asleep within 60 seconds. I can sleep for six hours and wake up and still feel like I haven't slept at all. Okay, yeah, that, that, yeah, that distinction does kind of um, make sense. I, I was actually um, hear, hearing your story, I was thinking like, were, were you at any point um, because I know like depressive people also have like, you know, issues with like energy and stuff like that. Was that also like kind of what some like what the doctor was considering too or is it, or does that also play into like your diagnosis? Well, I, I was, I do have a um, persistent depressive disorder diagnosed and uh and i guess now it's agoraphobia I, apparently i upgraded but i was i did have a persistent persistent depressive disorder i've had it all my life but i am a very firm believer in medication you know i try to help a lot of friends get on it and when people do i feel like it can be life-changing it just gets a bad rep because if you have just a primary care doctor giving it out, they don't really follow up as much. And it can be very dangerous when you're dealing with chemicals that deal with your brain. But I've been taking depression medications for years. And yeah, to answer the question, yeah, the doctors originally would think, oh, it's because you're depressed or, oh, the de uh, antidepressants aren't working. And that's what I thought, too. It wasn't until I was extremely to the point I am now that I started looking back at life and realizing that it, this whole condition started showing itself when I was about 28 or so. And, you know, now 10 years later, I'm just, it's full blown. Right. Right. I see. 
Um, well, to uh, to move away, um, not that this isn't like interesting, but I mean, my speciality isn't like content, so I should I, fish, I should pivot to that. <laughs> um, so like I, I think part of the reason why I was drawn to you was that you are a part um, of like this GTA Five like role play scene. Like I know you are trying to pivot towards like variety content in general. But um, like in that GTA Five like role play stuff, I know is like huge on Twitch, right? Like it's like think like consistently one of the more popular categories. Massive. And, it's always first or second. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I it's like kind of I think it's it's even gone to where it's like pivoted. You know, Rockstar from actually developing GTA Six because they're banking, I think, very hard on like GTA Online. Um, but I guess, um, I, uh, how would I word this? I, I guess keeping that in mind, because there have been rumors, of course, of like GTA six, is it going to come out? Is it not going to come out? You know, delays, things like that. I haven't kept up with the full news cycle on it, but for you, like with the potential of like, you know, GTA six and like the, uh, with an online edition coming with that. What what quality of life changes would you want from like a new sequel? That's a good question. You know, the thing with the thing that I feel like GTA has always gotten right has been there. I mean, it, it sounds crazy to say because the game is all about crime, but is their quality of life? I feel like they're really good at creating living environments, you know, where you feel like you're in a busy street. You feel like you're in a city. I do feel like probably things that could help is uh, maybe a more AI driven population that isn't just the same catchphrases over and over again. Uh, but they really, to me, the, you said it, they really broke through with this online. When they realized that they could take this entire map and put it online, was I think their biggest their biggest accomplishments yet. So improving on that in any way would be great. The thing that I am worried about though is the whole entire GTA RP community exists off of 5M. 5M is a service that connects to uh, to Rockstar to be able to use. What I'm afraid of with GTA 6 is if it's going to be able to be used because there was a point in time where Grand Theft Auto was trying to shut down 5M. Eventually they realized, wait, 5M is increasing our sales. Let's just, who cares about it? So that that's more of my concern. I hope they keep it the same. And just, I, I don't know, GTA to me just has, is still in my opinion, a, a great perfect world. It, that I mean, A great open world that people actually People actually create content in their own soap operas off of an existing world in a video game. Now, like for, because I know sometimes like you have like larger streamers that don't like normally um, do like consistently like GTA 5 role playing. Like they sometimes just do it as kind of like a novelty. Um, like, you know, like XQC, for example, has done a few like gta5 like streams inside like i think role play servers you know different different things like that yeah he was um, in the server. what's your what's your take on like i guess role play tourists we'll call them honestly i think it's great but it's also like everything else everything's a double-edged sword um while it's great it can also be harming because what ends up happening is people forget that they're in a role-playing server and now use the information knowing that this is somebody famous to kind of start leaning their way to try to get a little more exposure from their audience. And you see it all the time. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but you see it all the time on any, on any, uh, we can even leave no pixel. If you go to any of the uh, GTA RP communities and there's a celebrity on it, content and basically the entire content the entire city will start focusing on this one person the one good thing that i feel like the server that i'm on has is that there are a lot of these tourists and uh 
because there's so many, it's not as heavy as it can be on some servers. But then at the same time, you have people who do the opposite, where they see a big streamer and they make their character meaner to the streamer. It's it's very strange, but it's your typical, uh, you know, oh, it's a celebrity. Let me go towards them. When in a role-playing environment, you know, it's all about the character, not about you yourself. So, so your so your server is no pixel, right? Or um, I'm sorry because I don't know like the the names of these things. Is that your server? Yes, uh, no pixel is, uh, I guess you could say the premier Grand Theft Auto server. It's the one that usually all the streamers come to, which is I think what kind of set it way up there it also has usually the the more advanced uh um i guess modifications so a lot of other communities will make modifications to try to replicate it so basically if you go into 5m at any time you'll see a ton of no pixel inspired no pixel inspired no pixel replica stuff like that but yes, no pixel is the is the server that I am on. It's not my server, but I play on that server. Right. And so how did you become like more of a, a like an established member in that server because I was like doing like brief research on it and I saw that you even have like your own wiki where, you know, players can submit like their own pages for their own characters and it like goes like in. I was like, "Oh, wow. That's like a lot of effort." <laughs> so I I guess how did how did you get into that process? Uh, I've been, this is going to make me sound extremely lame, but I've been role playing since 1997. I started on, um, a game called Ultima online. And I guess it's just something when you, a storyteller, which is, I feel like what most role players are, the more storytellers or novelists or anybody in creative writing writes a story the better they get, you know, you use it or you lose it kind of a thing. And I feel like I've gotten to a point and through experiences and having a lot of bad happening and being kicked off of some servers because I did something wrong or anything like that. I think I got to a point where I can fine tune my character to make them believable because in role play, you'll always find people who say, for example, they role play a villain and they're this super wanted terrorist, but yet they spend all their time in a city cafe. You know, they do things that just wouldn't make sense. And, and it takes away from the realism where I went the opposite route and I go very, very realistic. Every character has its flaws, its benefits. Uh, the one that I do play on Grand Theft Auto happens to be a very loud and uh, outspoken preacher of a made up church that he has. And uh, it just, I guess it just ended up that way. I started doing a lot of uh, church related things inside the game. And when I say church, it's very loosely church. It's just church by name. There's no actual religion tied to it. And uh, yeah, I guess just from, if people find the content funny enough, you'll start creating your, your base or it's just like anything else on Twitch. If if you're a great shooter and you're playing Grand Theft Auto and everybody's seeing you in shootouts, you end up getting a lot of RP viewers who like shootouts. And, you know, you have your branches, you have your comedy group, you have a bunch of different... They like to call it SBS, which is a smooth brain syndrome. And I would say my character balances the line of being comedically stupid, but very realistic at the same time. And it's just naturally brought eyes on it. Damn, so you were on since Ultima Online. Shit, we got an OG here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, too, because... Um, uh, allegedly, Ultima hired me when I was way too young to be working because I used my brother's identity. <laughs> and I was a paid seer for Ultima Online. And what a seer is, is it's like, um, uh, what could I relate it to these days? It's like admin of a server, 
but their entire focus is role play. Like you're not there to answer tickets. You're not there to take care of bugs. Your entire purpose is to spawn enemies and make them talk and make people feel like the world is alive. And I was doing that for, for a bit and that was fun. Um, so I, I guess since you have like, obviously like role played in other games outside of GTA five, would you ever like move on from GTA five? Like, I would, are there any other games that you've kind of eyed that you want to like check out the, the scene in, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of games. I mean, yeah, like, there's I know still Final a lot Fantasy of 14 is like huge, right? Huge, now. huge. Yeah. I've actually, I've role played in final fantasy 14. Um, yeah, but that's what it comes down to. I think what it, what happens is there's a lot of role players, but a lot of role players don't want to venture into the part of voice role playing because that's vastly different. And the huge difference there is, you know, you're not sitting there typing. So you have to have obviously emotion in your voice. You have to be able to act in a sense, vocally act. And that's where that's where one problem comes in with uh, voice role play is a lot of the text role players feel that voice RP is kind of a, I guess you could say not as serious because there's a lot of self inserts. There's a lot of people who don't really have a character. They're just quite literally themselves talking and everything else. And it can become very strange, but I feel like for my path, I went from, from doing the stuff on Ultima to going into the MMO space. And I did a lot of MMOs and I did a lot of, uh, you know, I would find a Google search for what the RP server was going to be because it's more planned out than people realize. And I would do, I think I did role play on WoW, Aeon even. I went the whole way up. Final Fantasy fourteen, like you just mentioned, was actually what I, I guess from there is when I went into voice RP and that's where I started GTA RPing. So I've done the Final Fantasy scene. The thing is that there's um, a lot of different types of RP and some games are more notorious for certain types of RP compared to others. I wonder, like, obviously I imagine the, the developer, like Rockstar, is like aware of like its large RP community and it's like online servers in like its online space. Um, I, I, I wonder, because I, I don't know how well it would work, um, like, if they would ever incorporate any of, like, the RP, like, I don't know, let's say, like, storyline stuff into, like, the actual main game or even do it as a reference. Do you think there's any way that they would approach it, it like that? Or do you think that they would just do it purely from, like, you know, trying to focus on, like, the quality of life? things that would help like role players, you know, manage servers better, you know, what have you. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I kind of feel like as Rockstar being the big company that it is, I, I do feel like they would, um, they would rather do it secretly because you, you put too much human element into RP. And the problem that happens is RP communities are, are not very uh not very overly polite and friendly and uh recently it's finally been coming to light a lot of women in rp who have been sexually harassed and things of that sort and uh you know it's finally exposing itself so i feel like rockstar would help the role-playing community by sneaking things in but to outright claim it could be extremely dangerous to their brand. So I would see them not, not openly supporting it, but at the same time saying, you know, here's some quality of life stuff so we can keep a revenue stream coming from people who are not playing GTA online. Well, and like a lot of, I imagine like a lot of like role play servers would have to be careful about how they like monetize content, like spawning from it. Because I know you had like Blizzard recently that, um, I think with like the re-release then just like as a broad example uh the real re-release of like uh warcraft 3 where they put a clause saying that anything created in its game modes is like owned by blizzard so it, is that kind of any like precaution that you have to take in like managing like role play stuff or even like trying to like monetize it let's say oh big time 
big time. You have to consider there's a lot of companies who will allow you to use their product, but not make financial gain off the product. Um, I know what a lot of servers do, you know, there's, there's always loopholes in it. What a lot of servers do is they do the, the typical donation route. If you donate, you know, you can have exclusive this. If you donate, you can have a, you know, faster application process. So they make a lot of their, their income through donations, which don't get me wrong. You kind of have to do these servers are extremely expensive to run, especially the ones that are as big as the no pixel is. And you do need income coming in or it's just, it's not sustainable to keep something like that alive just for RP. So I think it, it does get into weird situations. I know recently there, it got to a point where a lot of vehicles were starting to be removed from no pixel server. And the only thing I could think of was due to branding because that's the main thing that they did. They took cars that were branded and took all the branding off of the cars. So I would think it's something to do with marketing. Maybe it's not wanting to get free, free uh, exposure or what, but yeah, I, I do feel the monetization in it is very, um, if I already forgot where we were going with this question, but the, yeah, I just feel. Well, like for even you as an individual, because um, I think I'm, try, I'm trying to remember. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I do like uh, I have to look into like a few different creators, but you're partnered with like your Twitch affiliate and you're partnered with like Throne or something like for merch. No, no, <laughs> no, not Throne. No, I've never been partnered with Throne. Um, I've never actually, believe it or not, I've never actually had a partnership partnership. I've had sponsorships, but no, I have, I'm not par partnered in any way. But there is like a link where you could like Buy, like, oh yeah, 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 merch or say, and then and like so, how does that like like benefit you? And I, I guess in that perspective, like how, what precautions do you have to take in like promoting while you're doing like the GTA Five like role play? I mean, I don't think it, I think it's just like every other game. I don't think you really have to worry about about that because they do have exceptions for streamers in general and youtube with you know how this rose a lot of games even have in their uh terms of service that you know they uh they will allow people to monetize off of their game if they're streaming it you know so stuff like that i don't think there'll be a problem with it's kind of become normal the only the only person who really doesn't like it is nintendo which is still blows my mind but um yeah i don't think you really have to ever worry about that mine is always I think I worry more about what sponsors to take because of what I, what my content is, because, you know, it's lewd. It can be stupid. It can be violent. So I'm more worried about who I take in sponsorships, I think, as opposed to them just finding sponsors. Uh, speaking of sponsors, uh, today's episode is brought to you by Salty Llama. Um, Hug, have you ever had any issues with your laundry? All the time. Well, boy, I have I an issue with right for you. <laughs> so, uh, today's episode is sponsored by Salty Llama. Are you tired of lugging around heavy bottles of detergent and dealing with the mess of measuring the right amount? Introducing Salty Llama, ultra concentrated, hyperallergenic, and toxins free laundry detergent strips that are revolutionizing the industry. Their eco friendly strips are easy to use. Just toss one in with your laundry, and you're good to go. The Salty Llama, you could say goodbye to harsh chemicals and hello to a cleaner, greener laundry experience. But it's not just good for the environment, it's good for you and your family. The hypoallergenic formula is gentle and sensitive skin, making perfect for babies, kids, and adults with allergies. Don't just take my word for it. Give Salty Llama a try and see the difference for yourself. You'll be amazed at how powerful and effective their detergent strips are. Visit www.saltyllama.com and order yours today. Don't forget to use the code PODCASTFASA at checkout for a special discount. Again, that's www.saltyllama.com. And that's code podcast pasta for a special discount. Um, thank you. So if I use podcast pasta, I get a discount on Salty Llama. Yes. I like that. Yeah. Eco-friendly and discount. Yeah, and it, it, it benefits me. I think it's like 10%. I, I can't remember the exact amount, but it, it's pretty, it's pretty decent. And, um, you know, they're like tiny little squares. You just throw it in. 
It's it's very interesting. Nice. Um, so I guess kind of pivoting to your more recent content, as you said, like uh, your variety streamer. I uh, I think I've like hopped in on a few of your streams, and I've seen you do like reaction to like different like you know um, media or like I, I think one time it was like a TikTok video or something. Um, but I guess why. I, I guess I'm curious why the broader pivot away from, uh, or like to just general content like that. Uh, all right. There's, um, there's this famous thing in GTA RP and that's, uh, being tunneled. It's, it happens to a lot, a lot, a lot of streamers. So, if you look at any time and you click on that GTA section in uh in Twitch, you will see people who I mean you're talking eighteen thousand people are watching. You got you got big people. The problem is viewers viewers can get very heavily invested, and when I say heavily invested, I mean I, I get it. You know. Think of people who cry watching TV shows when the character dies or, you know, they they get excited about things. And to me, that's what makes a good TV show, because if you're feeling emotion for something that is fake, you know, then the, the person producing that thing is is doing the right job. The issue with. With a uh, role play is that the viewers are there strictly for that. And. They will get to a point that they watch multiple GTA streamers and just hop back and forth between them to get different angles and different perspectives of things. And uh, they get very heavily invested to a point that if any of these like the larger streamers you're talking about, you can see them if they switch a game, say they decide to play Apex and, you know, they even have it in their title. They have it at the whole day. It says Apex, Apex at four, whatever. It hits that time and they switch over. You will see the viewership significantly drop. I'm talking like 10,000 plus just gone. And I feel like a lot of people, you can hear it sometimes in their voice. Sometimes they say it out loud that a lot of people get, they focus too much on RP that they get so much invested viewership from RP that they can never escape. it. And that's kind of like, I don't want to fall into that hole. Plus, I just, you know, to me, I started the streaming more so to have people to talk to. So kind of I feel like when I'm doing variety, it it gives me more chances to speak to other folks than when I'm role playing. Because role playing, I get very hyper focused. I'll be paying attention to what people are talking to me. You know, I'm focusing on the on the actual game and what's going on more so than I'm looking at chat and and responding. So. I kind of started pivoting for both reasons. So I know that like, like you said that you got into stream partly for like the social element of it. Um, but you know, considering like a lot of the work that you had, that you yourself have put into like, you know, creating like the character for the RP server and stuff like that. And like, you know, writing it down and everything. Have you, have you considered like scripted content or is that just like not, not your thing? I mean, I have, I have, I think my biggest issue right now is, um, with my health, I, I tend to, my motivation is very lacking. Like I, I already know that Twitch is not the place to make a living that Twitch streamers make their living off of other platforms. My biggest issue is me trying to do the work to spread it to other platforms is nearly impossible. Yeah, I, I just don't, there's no motivation. Everything exhausts me. Uh, I, everything gets heavy that I just don't want to do it. And for that reason, you know, everything is kind of, every other social media I have is very stale. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you, were you going to say something else or? Uh, no, this is my point exactly. I've already forgotten what we were even talking about. No, 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 you're good. <laughs> I, I, I get the general gist of what you're saying. Um, but I, I guess, uh, 
what are some because i know like obviously there has to be different approaches to like you know doing like streaming like as an art as like a role player versus just doing a variety streamer i think you know it's obviously different skill sets like what was like the biggest adjustment that you had to make and kind of like pivoting your content that way um actually the biggest adjustment isn't even something that i would say is like something to learn it's more something to to forget um but when it comes to rp communities there's a thing called meta meta is essentially you know someone telling you what happens so it's very important to not get your chat to provide meta so like say for example um somebody snuck into the trunk of your car and you are getting your car and you're driving and then chat's sitting there like oh bob's in the trunk bob's in the trunk with them doing something like that and even just you seeing it it now puts you at risk of meta it puts you at the risk of now anything you do from that point on if you end up looking in that trunk can now look like you've done it because somebody told you so i think the hardest part that i've had adjusting is when i'm playing variety games and my chat will say something like hey yeah go right here because of i will completely disregard it and try to do the exact opposite because in my mind i'm thinking wait you're giving me meta stop giving me meta and it's like i'm not role playing anymore they can tell me whatever the hell they want and that's where i think that's been my hardest adjustment as i was playing um elden ring not too long ago and my chat was telling me stuff and I think I even told them to stop metaing, and then I realized that they're they're not. It's a totally different game. Right, right. I got you. Um, but so I, uh, so you, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying to remember like your uh, Twitter profile. You you are like like a Twitch affiliate, right? Yes. Yes. Right. And I think, um, but you did. <laughs> And sorry for like my weird sleuthing here, but you did like a tweet from Kick asking about like affiliates, right? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. oh yeah. So I, I, I guess then I, I guess that begs the question: Would you ever consider like moving to Kick? Because I know like Twitch has had like some issues with its um terms of service recently that a lot of people were like up in arms over. Like there's some rule regarding like logos that can't be bigger than like i don't know they gave like some specific dimensions like that so yeah have you considered moving platforms oh yeah i've i've, I've streamed on kick before i've even tried uh youtube the the thing with twitch is i feel like twitch does everything to hurt the streamer more than to help the streamer and it sounds strange if you don't actually, if you're not on the platform and, you know, can dig through analytics and things like that. But the problem with live streaming is the same issue with, think of your, think of commercials on TV. You're sitting there watching TV and you know when your commercial break comes because the actual show can put the commercial breaks where they want and there'll be like a, a twist, the music of it fade out and that's where your commercials start. In RP, you can't do that. In streaming, you can't do that. So what ends up happening is there's a lot of very intrusive things that stop the viewer from watching your stream. So at any time, boom, here pops up an ad. They're now missing whatever is happening, and they usually will click off and go somewhere else because the ads on Twitch are not, they're not like a 30-second thing. It is, there's been times where I've gotten 12 ads in a row that I had to sit through before it would go back to the stream. And it's just their, their, their ad placement is just very intrusive, very damaging. The, this 50, 50 split, which I will tell you is not actually a 50, 50 split. It's more, uh, uh, I think it's a 45, 55 split, but just all of it is they're going in even further. It's every time you think that, they're going to improve something they they go the other way and hurt streamers more and i think what you were talking about with the with the logo thing that's a prime example of how they treat the streamers is it's almost like they feel like the streamers are too stupid to realize because after they posted that 
with ha- which had clear pictures of like these little cartoon characters and everything. It looked like a kid's book. They quickly removed it and then stated that us, we read it the wrong way. It, it, we did. They didn't mean it. We did. We just didn't understand what they were saying. Instead of just taking the accountability and saying, yeah, we, we screwed up with this. They tried pivoting the blame on the streamers for getting mad because they just didn't understand what we were trying, even though it's little little cartoon characters that a three year old would understand. I mean, it was very clear what they were saying. So, yeah, switching platforms, I mean, I'm, I'm all on board, all on board. No, I mean, although I personally I have like my own issues with okay, granted, I'm not like a streamer, but um, yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, because like you know, it it was started obviously as like a way for gambling streamers to like yeah. you know, that's that's out. literally why. It, that's why it started for sure. Yeah, um, so I'm not really sure. Like I I know a lot of people are like being drawn to kick because they're offering like these lucrative deals, but um, it, it kind of reminds me of like this article I was reading, and it, it's very it's very funny. They call it like the inshitification of like social media where Mm -hmm. it's like this life cycle of like um you know a platform first starts out as it's like very friendly very welcoming like these user positive like policies and then like when they rope in enough people they eventually like kind of in a way kind of entrap them to like only be on that um on that site so I wonder if we're seeing a similar cycle with Kick, where you know, is there just going to be a moment where they pull the rug from under its own creators? I mean, granted, assuming that Kick lasts long, because you know, it's not the only platform that's tried to dethrone um, Twitch in a way. But um, I mean, and again, this is no like judgment call on you. I understand that, like you know, a platform is a platform. You just gotta, you know, you, you gotta make that. You just gotta make that cheddar, so to speak. Oh yeah, I'm a hundred percent believer in that. I mean, I'm 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 all about you know learning where your food comes from before just blindly consuming it. My my thing is, what a lot of people don't realize is, don't get me wrong, I do not agree with gambling streams. But what a lot of people don't realize is, Twitch didn't ban gambling; they banned online casinos. It's a vastly different thing. There's still a lot of gambling on Twitch. There's still plenty of gambling that you can see on Twitch. It's it was more so directed at the gambling casinos like uh, where that's how you just said kick started. The thing with kick is kick is at the right place at the right time. What they do with that, though, is very dependent on themselves. And I feel like like you said, every social media hits a point where they need to decide if they're going to go the profit route or they're going to stick to this whole, you know, open, you're free to do whatever you want route. Every service does it because at the end of the day, you have to monetize or it's impossible for the business to run. Now, even if it's backed by state, you got to think of, and Twitch is backed by Amazon. Twitch shouldn't even worry about what money it brings in. It's just, it's one of those things that people don't do things for free in in this world much anymore, especially when it's a big service like that. Do I think kick stays? I think it has the ability to, because Twitch has literally given kick the platform. The problem is if kick is going to stick with their whole ways of thinking or if they are going to change their values and start following a more uh you know user guidelines route and i feel like that's all going to come from pressure of the community as a lot of people leave twitch and go over to kick at the end of the day they'll be the voices and you know you have enough streamers there that say hey we don't want this this is wrong you need to change this that's when things start changing so It's just, you know, yeah, 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 I just think uh, you have to know where where everything comes from and you have to understand every part of it because there's a lot hidden. And that's my my biggest issue was just the fact that, you know, there is still gambling on Twitch. 
it's still promoted to kids. So in my eyes, it's, it's just more of the same. Right. No, I got you. Yeah, because I remember it's like um, they're specifically banning like promoting like actual websites that like use real like you gamble with real money. But I think they were like more open to like, let's say you're doing it in a video game or something like that. Like I know Red Dead Redemption has like um, a very extensive like um, Texas Hold'em system or something like that. Oh, yeah. Like the, also the gotcha games are the same thing, but. No, but Twitch still has blackjack tournaments, which are, which are for cash. That's gambling. People gamble real money. Uh, there's still poker tournaments. There's there's other avenues that people gamble on Twitch. It was just more so towards uh, the crypto space because, I mean, I, I do agree. It, it is a little more sketchy. It is a little more sketchy, but I don't feel like... You know, I feel like there's nothing that Kick is profiting from, which just kind of goes back to your last question. I, I just don't feel like there's anything profiting that Kick can profit from to rug pull. Like, there are no real terms of services. Kick doesn't, well, there is, but they're a lot looser. Kick doesn't care if you have multiple, if you stream on multiple platforms. Kick doesn't try to kind of keep you inside this little box. So, I don't know. It's just perfect place, uh, right place, right time. And Twitch is, is, I feel like Twitch is burying itself right now. But, you know, like you said, there was, there was Mixer before. Where's Mixer now? Yeah, exactly. That's, that, I think that was the one I was remembering because uh, like, I think the timeline was like Ninja took a big deal with them and then That's immediately they went under. So he just banked. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't immediate. It did last a little bit, but. But yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't what they paid him worth of lasting. <laughs> yeah, it's so free I mean, money. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm very, I'm very like, I guess, cautious about Kick, especially like you know, knowing its yeah, origins. It's just but... got very sketchy roots to begin with. That it makes you question from the beginning, as opposed to like starting with a brand new clean company that may start going shady. So it's kind of yeah, I get where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I, I guess, um, I mean, I guess it's still open in the air for you though, where people will like find you in the future as far as like Twitch or, you know, kick or like YouTube. Yeah. To me, it's more about the viewership because there are a lot of people who will not leave Twitch, you know, that's just their home. Now, if Twitch ends up kind of going down and a lot of streamers leave, then they will probably leave. But until that happens, you know, for example, if I, I've gone live on kick before, I want to say the most viewership I've had on kick is probably maybe four viewers where on Twitch, I can usually get, you know, between 30 to 30 to 50 or so. And it's kind of like, you have to follow the numbers. So I stay on Twitch because that's where the viewership is. I mean, I promote every other platform because I would like a way to to escape it. But at the same time, there's just it's where we're at right now. Twitch is dominant. They have the most features. They have the easiest time for streamers to. You know, the tools that streamers need. So it's just to me, yeah, it's more. I transition wherever my viewers are willing to go because right now everything's still in the air. So I just keep going on Twitch until the day I decide, Hey, I'm either staying here or my chat decides that they do want to move with us. So I guess for you personally, what would be like that theoretical, like tipping point? Like what, what policy do you like, imagined or even proposed that would be like the final like you know what i'm i'm out of here uh i think it would be what they're what they are trying to do all this stuff that's happening right now is twitch trying to find a way to collect all the profit from the streamer what i mean by that is um you know right now they're getting money off of viewership but streamers don't make their money off of the ads Streamers make their money either off of providing content on different channels or sponsorships, partnerships. 
Twitch gets none of the sponsorship money. And the company is now skipping around Twitch and using someone on Twitch to advertise where Twitch advertises themselves. So what they're, what Twitch is trying to do is be the middleman and stop sponsorships from happening and have to go through them. So the money ends up in their hands too. And I feel like if they ever get to that point where it's, you know, they start controlling sponsorships that's when i think i'm just i'm dropping ship i feel like 50% is not is not adequate for what the streamer does compared to what twitch provides so i i guess granted this this question's a little different to ask for you because you're you know a streamer as opposed to like you know video essayists or things like that but I, I guess in terms of your content do you have any like broader plans on the horizon like you know I mean I mean we talked about you potentially moving but I mean like in terms of like any games you'll pick up in the future or anything like that uh, well I mean I'm always picking up games I, I do find I also get a lot of uh, companies who will email me to give me uh, you know access to the games if I do a sponsorship and things of that sort so I'm always playing new games, but I believe it or not, you did say it. I, I was looking at video essays for a while. It's just my issue that it comes with providing scripted content is the editing and all the after work that kicks in as well. So I did have, I, you know, you can find people to do this stuff for free and help. The issue is when you're not paying someone, it, you know, you're on their time. You can't sit there and be like, hey, I need this at five o'clock today. So, you know, that's what's really been stopping me because I just to me, it's like what makes streaming easy is I hit the button and then I, I'm just myself for however long I want to be there. And then I go bye bye. And that's very easy for me to do without, you know, straining my mind and my body too much to a point that I get overly exhausted. But I've thought of it. I wanted to do essays. I've had some ideas. I've even had some scripts done, but it's just, you know, following through with it. Yeah, it's kind of an unrelated note. Like, um, you, you and I are both a part of, um, or you and me, I can't remember what the right grammar is for it, but like we're part of um, a YouTube, like a smaller content creator, like uh, YouTube Discord. And I, I've seen like the postings where people are like, I'll edit for free. It's like, oh man, that's rough. Like, damn. You know, because it's like, yeah, oh, you're probably, you're probably like, your skills are probably actually worth real money, but it's just, it sucks to be in like that kind of situation where you feel like you have to like do it for free, you know? Yep. Yep. It's, but it is, I mean, if you think about it, that's how most editors have to do it. For example, like a lot of the, think of YouTube. I can't count how many creators do like a editing competition and whoever wins becomes a paid editor for them. So it's like, you kind of, I feel like it, in, the, in the world of uh, content creation, if you're an editor, you're not going to make your money being, uh, you know, like having a web page and saying, hey guys, I'm an editor, pay me this. I think it's more guerrilla style where you have to go in there and offer free stuff in hopes that you get something. And I think what the people are doing, the editors are doing in the, the channels you're talking about, I feel like it's more so a growing thing. I feel like in their mind, they, they're not that comfortable and confident with their editing. So they'd rather do it for free in hopes that they start getting more and more of their, they, like a portfolio, start getting more and more recognition from other content creators and it'll actually pick them up to where they want to go. So it, I don't want to see it so much as sad, but at the same time, it's just, it's a, it's a bad situation for any small small creator and I, i'll include editing i'll include everything music because of that because you have to put a lot into it with no return for a very long time i mean there's people who still i know i know streamers myself who's who've been streaming for four years and still cannot live off of what they make on content and it's just you know that's just how it is you're providing free until you can actually make the money that it becomes worth your time. So it's just the growing pains. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I and I understand like there's like also a passion to editing. Like some people generally do like it as yeah. like a job. That's yeah. Bless them. Like th- that to me is like a uh, the people who get a a college degree in mathematics. I'm just like what what what. <laughs> So, some people are just built that way, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, you know, like, chase your passions, right? Like, you never know, like, what'll land you a job, what won't, right? That, that's always my mentality for it. Um, but I guess we are approaching the hour mark. Uh, do you mind if we, we go a little bit over? I know I, I told you like it usually, uh, or I can't remember if I actually did tell you if it, my interviews usually last an hour, but if you don't mind, like it can go over a little. Yeah, no, I'm fine. I mean, I was just, I took today off of streaming anyways, cause I oh. had a, I had to, I had knew I had this and on top of it, uh, I got the phone call yesterday about having to travel to go pick stuff up. So it was kind of like, you know what, let me just take the day. So, yeah, no, I'm I'm free. Oh, cool, cool. Um, so I guess. So I, I I'm curious. Do you play games outside of streaming? Like this is always something that I ask, like content creators, because I know it, sometimes it could be annoying to like play a game outside of streaming. Like for me, it's the opposite. Like it's encouraged me to play games, like to capture footage, so I could use it as like kind of a background visual. Um, but I know some people are like, oh man, I, my content is, let's say all about Call of Duty. So like on my off time, I don't want to play Call of Duty, obviously. Uh, do you have like a similar mentality or like, how does it work for you? No, not at all. Believe it or not. Um, I want to say collectively, if we go through my entire time streaming, I've probably played on the server more offline than I have online. Um, when it comes to like games like Call of Duty, for me personally, I would probably treat that more like a job because I don't, I'm not the type of person who can do very competitive games for a very long time. I feel like if you get that frustrated over a game, it ruins the purpose of why you're playing the game. But, uh, Some and now to me, like I to still mad, play games. You know? Yeah, that's true. Some people like that adrenaline of raging, I guess. I don't know, but... To me, it's just, yeah, I, I like playing games off stream still. I'm sure other people, it could be different. But I feel like I also play a lot more um, more multiplayer games off stream. And I save single player games for stream. Because I feel like if you go on a single player adventure, having people there watching it will kind of... Having people there watching it will help them stay. Because they're it's like a, an episode where... Uh, or multiplayer games, you know, sometimes you just want to relax and not worry about what you're saying and not have to pay attention to three things at once. So, you know, so yeah, I still, I still play games uh, with that freedom of not having people watching it. Right. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you actually just reminded me with, um, the previous question, uh, I'm thinking like, uh, like for myself, like obviously I do it for free now pretty much because obviously I'm not big enough to make me off of it. But I've, I've kind of always thought about like this weird crossroads where, you know, like right now in my life, um, I would either want to like obviously do this to make money because, you know, I need money, right? It's just the world we live in. Um, yeah. Or to... Or to take the opposite route and just kind of like approach it like a public access content in a way where I just completely do it like free. Like I even drop like the sponsorship, like Patreon and whatever, uh, switch my licensing to like Creative Commons. Um, because I, I've always, myself, I've always been a fan of like public access, like shows. Um, and you know, you're like me, you're like, you're, you're an old head, so to speak. So you, we, we both probably grew up at a time when it was like more prominent prominent like PBS and stuff like that before mm-hmm. like you know obviously the move to like streaming and like YouTube and everything but you know um I don't know yeah there, there's just like an aspect of that that I loved like that I would always like to like kind of capture that I would always be tempted to capture my content if I you know if I didn't like let's say need the money or whatever um, no I I think that's I think that's what separates uh successful content creators and unsuccessful is you kind of touched on it earlier too is 
it's more so the passion. Would you be doing it if you weren't paid for it? And don't get me wrong, when anything becomes your daily job, you won't love it as much as you used to. But it's, it's everything you just said. Like, if you're not making money off of it, you would still be doing it because you, it's something you enjoy doing. And I think that's the biggest key to it all, is if it's something you're actually in for, not just blindly going because you're like, ooh, I can make money, you're, you've got way better chances of succeeding because, it, to be fair, every content creator, especially nowadays, it's, it's maybe, I'd say, 20% content, 80% luck. I, I strongly agree. It's more just peop, some random moment that makes something take off. I didn't know a lot and like playing the luck with the algorithm and everything like that. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. The algorithm game. Yeah. You know, I went to college for that algorithm and I still don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And now we're trying to grasp like chat GPT and stuff like that. Um, Which I, I think I love that stuff. I think that was, a sp I, feel, I feel for content creators, that was a blessing. I mean, it, it helps do a lot of your, um, especially the Google one, you can get a lot of your SEOs off of it. You can get a lot of your, you know, your buzzwords, your hot topics, all that kind of stuff with AI. So do I fear AI? I always find, find it funny when people would talk about the AI and they have that fear of AI taking over. And it just reminds me of, like you said, everything we've grown up through. I remember, um, Pokemon was going to turn us all demonic. Uh, the Satanic Y2K, panic. Y2K was going to kill us all. So it's like, I just feel like it's something that everybody has with technology that's brand new. Yeah. But I mean, myself, I don't want to, I, I, I swear to my listeners, I don't want to open up this can of worms again. I've talked about <laughs> this a lot. <laughs> but, um, you know, with like, AI broadly, I, you know, I, I think it is fair to be like cautious about it and to like, you know, like there's a whole branch of like, oh, I forgot like um, what the actual term was called or something, but like uh, ethicist or something like focusing on like, you know, I, I think it's okay to question like what role we want like these technologies to play like in our day to day life. Right. Um yeah, you know, because you have like libertarian like tech bros that are like, no, like full steam ahead, like you know, not thinking about like the human element or how we. Well, I think that's the biggest issue too when it comes to AI, and I think that's its biggest downfall is the fact that someone is programming the AI and someone is teaching the AI. And when I say someone, I'm not referring to like you know the people who just completely made the program. I'm talking about where the AI is getting its knowledge from. So like you have, I can't tell you how many, you know, you hear people talking about chat GPT and the, uh, what's the other one, the photo one, um, but Dolly, I think it's Dolly. Diffusion. I, yeah, like stable diffusion. Yes, stable diffusion, Dolly, yeah. those type of things. The ones that make images, um, you know, they see the success of those, but they seem to forget all of the other AIs that have existed that because of the input they've received from people have just completely corrupted themselves. Like, I don't know if you've heard of a, it was all over the news fairly recently. There was um, an AI companion. And if you paid monthly, he would, you know, like uh, be sexual with you. Well, this AI, the, the one that people paid to, you know, sit there and I guess text, sexed on whatever with the AI got to a point that it began sexually harassing its own clients. I remember it, reading send, those articles, yeah. it was wild. <laughs> and that's my, my biggest thing is like, I feel like humans will always fuck it up because we always test things and we always want to see just how dumb something can be, or just where we can take something that I feel like we are going to, we are the thing that stops AI every single time. Right, right. Um, well, uh, we are a little bit past um, the hour mark. Uh, to my listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a number of different ways. Uh, for monthly donations, I recommend my Patreon account. 
Um, there's like three different tiers. Uh, with all the tiers, you get your name read aloud at the end credits here, but I don't have any patrons, so is what it is. Uh, if you want to do one-time donations, I recommend Ko-Fi. Ko-Fi also lets you do monthly, but I would recommend Patreon because, you know, you get the perks with Patreon. Um, all this is linked on my Twitter account and my profile page, at uh, Podcasting Pasta. Again, that's at Podcasting Pasta, all one word. It's all lowercase. I don't, I don't think it matters with uh, Twitter. Um, I also have a merch store featuring uh, a lot of promo art, my logo and a lot of promo art done by the great George Isaac of Nocturnal Essent. Uh, also linked in the link tree. Um, Hug, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you want to shout out where people can find you, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, people can find me at uh, Twitch TV, uh, the Hug Dealer with underscores in between each word. So the underscore Hug underscore Dealer. Um, yeah, that's I mean the main the main axis is there, and then everything else is kind of can branch off of there. But that's where I'm prim primarily at. I guess before I let you go, I, I, I was curious about, like, how did you come up with your, your name? Because I love it. <laughs> well, it started from, um, I used to go to music festivals very heavily. Like, I would travel to music festivals and, you know, I may or may not have dabbled in some uh, explicit substances. And at the time, I used to make jokes and because I was the dad of the group, you know, after having kids, you kind of start, you kind of start watching everything from, from your, your parenting point of view. So whenever I'd be on these substances, I became like, you know, the guy who would run around and take care of everybody. And it started from there. I started calling myself the hug dealer because I'd, I'd be there to give you a hug and help you. And, and, and then it just kind of kept going and, it stuck for a while and now we always you know say dumb things like uh your first hug's free after that we charge but it's just you know a play on the whole drug deal hug deal and then personal experience beautiful well th thank you thank you all for joining us um and thank you for salty lum for sponsoring the episode and yeah uh just take care later <laughs>